The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay. Well, even though we've been hinting at networks pretty heavily all the way through the course, these are the three lectures where we actually take it on. We uh, really started this at the end of uh, last week's lecture, so-called Protein 2, where in the process of talking about protein modifications and quantitating metabolites and their interactions with proteins, we started talking about the sorts of sources of data that you would have uh, that would allow you to get at uh, uh, quantitative analyses of protein networks, such as uh, red blood cell. So we're going to pick up on that theme by talking about macroscopic continuous concentration gradients and contrast that with mesoscopic or discrete molecular numbers. We're just going to very briefly touch upon uh, the issues in discriminating between the stochastic modeling and the continuous modeling. And uh, a very interesting connection between the red blood cell model where you have a few examples of cooperativity with modest Hills coefficients to take that to an extreme case where you have actually bistability, where you have two stable modes which are separated um, by a very cooperative interaction. And then we'll talk about uh, copy number control as another opportunity for doing it modeling either by continue, macroscopic continuous modeling or um, this uh, stochastic modeling. And then uh, after the break, we'll talk about flux balance optimization, which I think is a really exciting uh, and uh, clever way of leveraging the little bits of information that you have about very complicated uh, regulatory networks, bi biochemical networks. So I think we've kind of just barely touched upon this before. Why were the, the particular networks that uh, are being studied, how did they come to be studied? Why? and how. And typically what they have in common is that they have large genetic and uh, biochemical kinetic data sets to go with them and or. Right now there's no model that, it, it, that describes all of the interesting aspects of an entire cell or an entire organism. Um, usually they're little pieces of it. The closest to a whole cell is the red blood cell and this is because there's no biopolymers uh, components to it, no biopolymer synthesis. Uh, today we'll talk a little bit more about these two related topics, which is cell division cycle and uh, the segregation of, of chromosomes during the cell division. Here the key point is the, uh, cr the critical nature of single molecules in uh, these uh, that come into play in the dividing cells. And in this, there, they'll be talking about bistability, how there's a, a decision of either to take the next step in dividing the cell or not, and how uh, that bistability can be achieved either stochastically, where you're dealing with the fluctuations of single molecules, greatly affecting a switch, such as a, a phase lambda switch, or you can have it involving large number of molecules, where stochastics seems to play a, a less of a role. And then we'll then. At the end, we'll talk about how we can do comparative me metabolism, where we really integrate genomics with a, a network model of biochemistry uh, at multi many different levels. Of course, there's the genome encoding the, the components of that network, but there's also the uh, systematic knockouts of, of genes and their effects on the network. Now, we've also seen this is this slide is also reviewed, but it puts in context where we're mainly been talking today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ordinary differential equations, both for at the beginning under red blood cell and and in the uh, a bistability discussion, how you can get even with just con just concentration and time, you can get these very interesting behaviors, highly cooperative. And then we'll we'll drop concentration and time by a steady state approximation. We talk about flux balance in the second half. And of course, bef you know, before we were talking about. Uh, molecular mechanics in the context of protein structure and master's equations are the way of looking at stochastic single molecules, which we'll mention in passing.
Uh, eventually in the network uh, discussions we'll get to spatially inhomogeneous models where you actually care uh, or realize the importance of where particular molecules lie uh, in terms of their function. Now what are the limits and problems in connecting the in vitro uh, parameters that were so key last time and this time in, in uh, developing a system model? By, by isolating particular molecules, you can have, uh, you can cut off, make a, the system simpler, uh, but then there's the problem of reintegration. And here, this is more a historical artifact than, than really uh, critical to this discussion. And originally, enzyme kinetics uh, would ignore the products for technical mathematical reasons. But as you can see from last time, we showed that you could represent those equations quite well and, measure, and even me make the measurements. In the presence of products, it would just be a, another few terms in the um, rate equations. Uh, more critical, however, is that the product is, including the product along with substrate in the measurements and the modeling, is just the first step because how many different products and substrates and, and other regulatory uh, molecules might be involved that you don't know about initially. In addition, uh, the conditions for doing the in vitro measurements are n really, it's hard to do them at the concentrations in, in cells. In, these con in cells, they're nearly crystalline densities, that is to say, up to 30% or so, uh, uh, which, is ver which is basically the, the, the concentration, the very high concentration of solute that occurs, uh, uh, proteins and other macromolecules. And uh, some, the, the substrates, the small molecules, are typically in vast excess in, in vitro reactions, but they're very close to equal molar and vivo. Uh, because a lot of them are bound up with enzymes. And you get interesting observations, such as this one mentioned at the bottom, where uh, a chemical reaction, which is spontaneous in solution, which is the uh, uh, epimerization of galactose, does not occur in uh, normal cells, uh, un uh, E. coli, unless they have an enzyme that, that catalyzes this normally spontaneous reaction. So this is curious that it happens in solution, doesn't happen in the cell unless you uh, have the enzyme. Um, okay, so with all those caveats in mind and recognizing that, that even though this model has more measured parameters than almost any other cellular model, they were all measured in vitro with the caveats that we just mentioned. And uh, the, the cell is aimed the, the function of all these, this network is mainly to provide the, the redox that keeps the hemoglobin uh, reduced and the ATP that keeps the osmotic pressure under control. Uh, so you have, and also the cell is, even though we've shown a little structure in this network, the, the structure is, is assumed to be fairly continuous within the cell, which is a fairly good approximation in this case. So this is not merely the stapling together of some kinetic in vitro parameters. We have uh, other considerations in a real cell. We have the uh, sort of physical parameters of the uh, mass balance, energy balance, and redox balance. We've already mentioned energy and redox, uh, but that you have to have conservation of, of mass, as we'll see develop uh, quite a bit more in the second half of this talk. Uh, in addition, there are physics uh, such as the osmotic pressure and electroneutrality. There are cells which do, uh, uh, you know, have transients of uh, non-electroneutrality. But for the red blood cells, certainly one of the the goals is to maintain very close to electroneutrality and osmotically stable. You want to have as many non-adjustable constraints as possible, as, as in other modeling systems. These non if these are measurements rather than mod adjustable model parameters, uh, then, it, then it allows you to, uh, to uh, test the few hypotheses you have and have them overdetermined and look for contradictions, um, outliers. And then we can uh, eventually we'll, we'll see advantages to knowing what the maximum fluxes and maximum rates that you can have in these complex networks. Um, and we can incorporate gene regulation, as we've seen lots of wholesale, uh, increasingly accurate 
data on gene regulation is becoming available. It would be nice to integrate these because the, the expression of the proteins affects their activity. The activity affects these fluxes. So these fluxes are represented here in uh, slide number eight as dx dt, where each of the x sub i's represents a, one of these blue dots, a node in the network uh, where you have four basic processes that affect it at up to four. You can have synthesis steps, degradation steps, so synthesis produces, transport can bring it into the, the cell, degradation removes it, and it can be utilized, incorporated into the body of the cell, and this is essentially, you can think of this as a sink, removing it from the, the free population of the, the uh, each freeze X molecule. And this can be restated as a stoichiometric matrix, S of IJ, where you basically, that's mainly uh, ones and minus ones, as you can see in front of each of these uh, fluxes, uh, synthesis, degradation, so forth, will be ones and minus ones that refer to uh, the stoichiometry, and sometimes twos and zeros. And then there's an, uh, then the transport is its own uh, vector, <coughs> and you'll see the utility of the stoichiometric matrix, where I is the, the metabolite number and J is the reaction number or the enzyme number. Um, for all the possible reactions that can occur in a cell. Um, these can be all possible reactions, and you can toggle them on and off with mutations or changing different cell types. Now, this particular, uh, uh, particularly rich system, the red blood cell, has been modeled uh, many times and continues to be modeled since the mid-70s and now into the uh, 2000s, starting originally just with uh, glycolysis later adding uh, pentose phosphate, nucleotide metabolism, various pumps, osmotic consideration, um, uh, hemoglobin ligands have been treated from time to time, and less so uh, issues having to do with calcium and shape. No model includes all of these uh, in one model, although it, it, uh, it's very, really very close, but there are models that, that include uh, all of the metabolism that we know in the transport and os osmotic properties. Um, relatively few of those are available, were made available uh, broadly, but now, now more they're increasingly being made available freely on the web, as models should be. Uh, the assumptions behind this is that. Uh, uh, this, like I said, not everything is, is modeled. Some of it for mathematical convenience, uh, you, will be, you will typically, in order to differential equations, since there's vast ranges of time constants from things that happen extremely quickly to things that happen extremely slowly, typically what you do is you'll model a, a widow, window in the middle where you'll say uh, things that happen very quickly can be treated as a pseudo-equilibrium, as we've listed in this middle line here on slide 10. Things that happen extremely slowly can be treated as a constant. If they happen over the period of you know, years, then in the course of, of an experiment that might be hours, uh, they can be treated as a constant uh, or something that you systematically explore. We will, uh, although we typically uh, be ignoring little pieces of the metabolism like guanine metabolism, calcium, uh, these as either as data comes in from other systems and you treat it, try to treat it by homology or analogy. Uh, in addition, when we talk about a typical cell, this can mean that we, have a, we assume homogeneous distribution of molecules within the cell and homogeneity from cell to cell within a particular organism. It also means that there's a tendency to, to model a, a wild type without respect to polymorphism, although in human population, with uh, red blood cell function in particular, there's quite a, quite a literature on mutations that affect the functioning of the, um, uh, of the proteins within the red blood cells. Probably one of the best studied human bi uh, genetic systems. Okay. Um, surface area is not absolutely constant, although for the time being it's modeled as such. This is some examples of a subset of it. This is a subset that refers to glycolysis. Uh, 
Uh, it is, uh, you can see they all have the same form where you have a change in a concentration in moles per liter with respect to time of some small molecule here, glucose 6-phosphate. It's some synthesis rate with the subscript being hexakinase. Um, this is the upper left-hand uh, corner. Uh, and then that's the synthesis minus the, the sinks, the degradation rates, which go through two other enzymes. Uh, again, a reminder at the bottom, you'll see this come up a, a few times, just a reminder, it's a chain, each of these is a, is a form of change in the concentration of some uh, small molecule with respect to time is a, is a sum of the synthesis uh, subtracting the degradation transport utilization. Okay, now remember we focused in on one little piece of this a couple of times now. This is, this is a step that happens to be uh, allosteric. That means that depending on the concentration of the, 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 uh, the numerator here tends to be uh, composed of, uh, or the top part of this formula tends to be composed of substrates and products having an effect, and then down this, this term in the denominator has a fourth power dependence on a variety of other site effectors, including AMP. And you can see that, uh, that the, the velocity is either hyperbolic, which is the uh, sort of the upper curve, which kind of goes smoothly up and plateaus, while the sigmoid curve implies greater cooperativity, which can be affected by some of these other site effectors, uh, which is more sigmoid in shape. And we'll, we'll use this as a stepping stone to talking about how do you, what are the various ways of getting that sh sigmoid shape. We've already talked about how proteins can be multimers, dimers, tetramers, and so forth. That could be one way of achieving the sigmoid shape by a, a, a confirmation change which senses the second site. But we'll talk about another way in just a, a couple of slides. When we have the kinetic expressions here, we, uh, they have the form of the previous one. Most of them are simpler than the one in, the, in slide 12. Uh, the model has a total of 44 rate expressions. They have about five constants uh, on average, so about 200 parameters. These are not truly adjustable in the sense that, that they're, you know, they're determined from the in vitro uh, reactions. So what kind of assumptions? Uh, we've already mentioned the difference between in vitro and in vivo. Uh, we have the lingering question of how many effectors might there be that we don't know about. Typically, these in vitro experiments were done with a small number of substrates and products that you know about. But as a worst case scenario, Mike Savageau likes to trot out uh, glutamine synthase, which fortunately is not in this particular model, but it but it, it could be that there's a, an enzyme that's just as complicated but hasn't been studied as much. And in the case of glutamine synthase, there are three substrates. Remember the, the previous example, there were only two substrates and two products. Glutamine synthase has three substrates, three products. It has nine allosteric effectors rather than the, you know, uh, three or so in the previous example. So this gives a grand total of 15 different molecules you need to track. So if uh, the number of different measurements you might have to make, hypothetically, this is, no one's actually made this number of measurements, but Mike Savage likes to uh, point out that even if you only did four concentration points in this multidimensional space, you would have four to the 15th measurements or billion measurements. Uh, a billion isn't nearly as intimidating as it was when he made this statement in 76, but it still is uh, not, not something that's routinely done. Um, what other constraints? So these physical chemical constraints of osmotic uh, pressure and electroneutrality here stated a little more explicitly. You have uh, pi I equal to pi E. That means the, out the pressure on the inside is equal to the pressure on the outside. That sounds like a good way to balance things out so that the cell doesn't explode. And explicitly what that means is these uh, gas constant R times the uh, absolute temperature degrees Kelvin times this sum of the uh, pressure components for the J molecule going up to M chemical species for I interior, standing for interior, 
is equal to the same sum, equivalent sum for the subscript E for exterior. Electroneutrality has the same set of concentrations for the I interior and J molecules, where now Z is the charge, where charge is the same Z that we had in M over Z for the mass spectrometry. So, okay, and each, each model I give you, or some of the models I give you today, we'll, we will compare it uh, to the, the calculated and the observed, as we have done before. And here it's shown a little bit differently than how I've done it before and how we'll do it later on. Uh, typically, we would have uh, observed on one axis and calculated on the other. In this case, we're, we're sorting them. Uh, in general, we're looking for outliers, and here we're sorting by the degree to which they deviate from uh, observation. And so we can, the, devi the deviation is going to be observation minus the calculated, and the degree of deviation can either be normalized to the standard deviation, which is basically normalizing it to how confident we are in the experimental measure, or it can be normalized to the average value, which uh, then becomes less dependent upon the accuracy of the experiment and more dependent upon, you know, the fraction of the, and so we've sorted it on the latter, uh, and you can see that most of them are less than two standard deviations, sorry, uh, deviation is uh, uh, less than twofold the average value and uh, less than seven standard deviations in terms of the measurements. Uh, but the ones that are furthest to the right uh, are clearly the ones that require the most attention, either in the experimental measurements or in the modeling. These are steady state measures. This is kind of an abuse of a beautiful kinetic model, um, but it's, it, it reflects the, the, the uh, limited data that exists, and it's much easier to collect steady state data where basically the red blood cell, any, every particular molecule, even though there fluxes in and out of every molecule, the molecule concentration itself is staying constant. Now, if you so that's how you, uh, if you're assuming each molecular concentration is staying constant with friction with respect to time, you're just measuring um, steady state levels. But if you're more interested in looking at the dynamics, the movie of how uh, molecules will change if you perturb uh, the, uh, the system, you can think of a, a wide variety of different curves that this, the time courses can take. And one way, and, and then the challenge is how do you represent them? You have 40 some different uh, small molecules, you're tracking the concentrations, and then the time course can range over hours. Uh, but here, one way of doing it is, is doing pairs of substrates at a time, substrate A and B, and, uh, and then monitoring the time course as a vector. Think of these as a series of little points along here. Um, and if Let's look in the uh, in slide 17. Look in the upper left, number one. If let's say A is converted to B, or uh, so that A plus B is equal to some constant, you can see this this um, slope of negative one, exactly negative one, because every, every for every molecule of A that's consumed, the molecule of B is produced. And so when you see this uh, perfect slope of negative one, then that's the kind of relationship you expect between those two. Um, even if the, even if you're sort of randomly sampling a dynamic system, here you're taking a time course. Um, number two is a pair of, of concentrations to equilibrium. You'll get an equilibrium constant, and the ratios here will not be uh, negative one. They will be some, some constant which determines uh, that equilibrium. Um, you have two uh, dynamically independent metabolites, as in uh, quadrant three here. Basically, as you march through um, uh, increasing B, A can stay constant because it doesn't really care. It doesn't responding to changes that in B or changes that res result in B changing. And then maybe some other set of uh, uh, dynamics will cause A to change and B stays constant. And if you and if you sample enough time course, you may find that this fills up the entire space uh, concentrations available to A and B. Uh, showing no correlation. Another interesting type of phenomenon you can see is that uh, not every possible concentration of A is not completely independent of B. As, as uh, you might start at a particular point in a time series at this gap here in the lower right, and you start increase, uh, decreasing B and increasing A, and then at some point the dynamics of the entire network, not just A and B, contribute to now A taking a dive down and B increasing.
and eventually you return to that steady state point and you've described all the conditions that, that, that you might uh, be able to achieve in this closed loop. So we're going to look at these kind of phase diagrams of concentration of A versus concentration of B, um, where a, time, a series of time points would be color-coded. These can be either lumped as they are in this diagram or in the next um, slide we'll see them separated out one metabolite at a time. But it's the same concept whether you've got a group of metabolites involved in glycolysis lumped together uh, compared to, say, a group that are redox. You have in the lower left of, e of each of these uh, quadrants is this time series that we've been looking at. And the upper part is, a, is the correlation coefficients color-coded so that blue is uh, negative correlation and gray is very significant positive correlation and everything else is something in between. So what you see from these is, you see, for example, here's this a curve that's very close to the negative one curve as if there's a conservation reaction here between glycolysis and the adjacent steps. Uh, you see little uh, loops, for example, in the lower left, uh, adenine biosynthesis and uh, uh, in that row. Uh, and so on. You see examples of each of these kind of behaviors here where you're going from the red point, uh, these little dots in red, to green, to blue, to yellow, to the end gray in uh, increasing time coarseness from starting with 0.1 hour resolution and ending with 300 hour uh, resolution. Okay, this is lumping where we're kind of looking at things like ATP and redox loads. Now, if we look at it one molecule at a time, you obviously get a more complex, you get every possible pairwise combination of molecules, and uh, you can see this full dynamics. Now, these are, not, these are not data. These are all simulations, and unfortunately, we don't have uh, that kind of dynamic resolution in experimental data just yet. But this gives you some idea. If you see some particularly interesting phenomenon here, then it might be a motivation for going in and looking at um, the data in more detail. Okay. Now, we mentioned this, this difference between the um, sort of ordinary uh, hyperbolic curve in the upper left, of, actually the lower right of this whole slide, but the upper left of the, of the insert, and the sigmoid curve that you get from uh, an um, allosteric interaction. And, this trans and it within, the, the, this whole cell is set up for transporting oxygen. And as oxygen concentration in increases, for hemoglobin, you either get this uh, hyperbolic or sigmoid curve. As it gets increasingly sigmoid, increasingly cooperative um, with increasing amounts of, of one of the uh, intermediate metabolites, 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, uh, and this, you can see, this is now the connection between the glycolytic pathway, the, regu the regulation that's sensing the state of the glycolytic pathway, and the um, uh, hemoglobin. In addition, there are connections with the, the pH, which is also regulated in this, uh, and the redox, you can see just above it here, the hemoglobin going to the unproductive methemoglobin state. So you can see there are connections uh, in the network between its ultimate function, which is transporting oxygen, and all these intermediate uh, metabolism components. And it also brings us to this topic again of this cooperativity and how, it, what, how does it arise here in the hemoglobin has a tetrameric conformation state change, which is the, the, there's a second site that binds this organic um, uh, diphosphoglycerate. But another direction we can take, the, so in the lower left-hand corner of uh, slide 21 is the same icon again of how we get increasingly cooperative from hyperbolic to sigmoidal um, to the point where this becomes almost vertical and, dis and displaced from the origin so that the cell at a, at a good point in response to a, a stimulus will make a decision to commit to the next phase in cell division. Just as we had this, this is similar to the cell division that we talked about earlier in the context of the microarray analysis of yeast cell division. Here we're talking about uh, Xenopus amphibian oocyte, which has nice large cells to do this kind of study, um, where, where you need to decide to come out of G1 and commit to synthesizing DNA in the S phase in the lower portion of the circle, where you get now two DNA molecules. And once you're convinced that you've made rep finished replicating all your DNA, only at that point then can you commit to mitosis, 
another decision, a uh, major decision, and then you get two cells and you go back and you complete the cell cycle. So the little time course at the bottom here is, should be reminiscent for you of the time course we had of RNA synthesis of you know, various clusters of RNA. Here is the DNA synthesis. You can see it ramps up in the, in the red S phase and then ramps down in the metaphase due to the creation of two new cells. But we want to talk about how do we make this as, you know, uh, responsive to, say, progesterone as something that, that, that is signaling cells that might be waiting uh, for long periods of time uh, to complete the next step in the division cycle for an external hormone stimulus that it's time to start uh, um, uh, the next step in cell cycle. We want this to be displaced from the origin. You don't want it to be just flipping on and on, off, irrespective of the stimulus. But you, when it does flip, you want it to go very quickly. So how would we model this? And what, what? So look at the upper right-hand uh, diagram of slide 22. And you have a set of these uh, oocytes kind of diagrammatic, diagrammatically indicating their state. Their state determined by to what extent are they ready to uh, uh, commit to uh, the next division state. Here, we can think of it as the biomarker is the state of phosphorylation of a protein, uh, MAP kinase. If it's phosphorylated, um, then it's committed to this division, and we can think of this as the black uh, side of this gradient going from white to black. But the, if you grind up a whole population of these oocytes and measure the total MAP kinase phosphorylation as a function of increasing stimulus, S, um, in this case progesterone, the response, that is to say the phosphorylated state and the commitment to, to mitosis, um, will gradually increase, as indicated in the kind of the gradient model. But that's if you ground up all the cells. But what if you asked, if it, the other way of obtaining that result would be if each, each cell is making an all or none decision, and what happens is the probability of a cell being in that all or none state changes with increasing stimulus to progesterone. And that is the lower model and is, in, and is in fact closer to reality, as indicated by the experiment at the, at the bottom uh, part of the slide here, where you have, at a, you, you'll ha this is a part of a concentration curve where you're increasing the stimulus progesterone, but at this particular stimulus, you can sample individual cells. There's enough of the cell that you can actually do proteomics on individual cells. And the proteomics here is a Western blot. We mentioned this a uh, couple of uh, lectures back. And here, each, you can see the two states of the MAP kinase. The phosphorylated state is the slower electrophoretically. It's the upper band in this diagram. And uh, the lower band is the unphosphorylated state. And you can see there's no example here of a, of a cell which is in an intermediate state where it has sort of half and half or 40, 60 of the two different protein forms. However, if you as a thought experiment, took all those cells and mushed them up and took this and ran it all in one lane, you would see a mixture. You would see all the intermediate states, and that would be a function of progesterone. So this is a, a warning, uh, similar to the ones I said before, that when you grind everything up and mix uh, populations of, of cells or molecules, uh, you need to be careful that because different cells may be in different states, different molecules may be in different states, and the average behavior is not the same as individual. So here is, so, but now that's only part of the, the lesson here. The cells are going through this all or none uh, process. We can monitor it by single cell proteomics, but how do we model it? Well, in very abstract terms, the response here can be modeled as uh, in this Hill coefficient, where you have a stimulus S, some uh, kinetic constant K, kind of like a, a Michaelis constant, where, where it's basically as S gets closer to K, it has a, a larger um, uh, response here, uh, effect on the response, and, the, and, the, uh, and that's nonlinear because you have the exponent H. Uh, and the, more, the lar larger H is, the more nonlinear it is. So let's say the H is 1 in this little uh, schematic to the right here. It's hyperbolic. Um, no sigmoid character at all. In the case of hemoglobin and uh, phosphofructokinase that we talked about in the red blood cell, it's more sigmoidal, like a, uh, an H of 2.8, almost uh, cube law there. Um, 
And in fact, even within this system, one of the steps that we'll talk about in uh, the next slide um, has a, 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 where you have a stimulus of a MOS protein and a response of the, map, the same MAP kinase phosphorylation response, it has a modest uh, sigmoid uh, Hill coefficient of 3, just like hemoglobin. But the overall response uh, uh, of MAP kinase to progesterone has an enormous um, exponent of 42. That means it's, all, it's almost vertical and it's displaced from the origin. How do we get that? Okay, so, oops. So here is a, a proposed model, and it's an interesting snapshot in the inevitable ev evolution of a mod model from something very primitive, which might have just been the MOS to uh, MOS effects on that kinase, kind of as a direct effect here, um, which, as we said, has a Hill coefficient of about threefold. Uh, sorry, yeah, Hill coefficient of three, not threefold, because that's an exponential. But overall, combination of two other factors, that you have a chain of modifiers, each close to saturation, meaning that each one has a slight sigmoid uh, behavior, and that's, and you've got, uh, um, sorry, uh, it could be a hyperbolic function, such as, let's just say, this dotted line um, that's going up smoothly from zero, where it says neither. That would be the effect of, if you just have a normal uh, enzymatic reaction, with no Alice theory, no feedback, no ultrasensitivity. Um, if each of those has a component, and you're close to saturation, meaning your su substrate is very high, so you're going as fast as the enzyme will go, if you have a chain of those, you can show through kin uh, kinetic modeling that that will create a very a high sensitivity to the reaction. And that's what uh, the, the furthest dotted curve uh, close to the axis um, is, ultrasensitivity alone. And then this. Here you have progesterone going in in the uh, upper left, affecting a complicated rate. Now these rate constants don't necessarily mean a, a unitary, simple kinetic uh, step. They can represent something as complicated as going from amino acids, AA, to a, a particular protein, MOS. Uh, and then the reverse reaction, K in case of minus one, is the degradation of MOS back to amino acids, which is not you know, or reverse of the same enzyme set by any means. Um, the next step, K2, is simpler. It's just MOS being phosphorylated by, actually, our friend Matt Kinase um, in its phosphor state, for producing, the, catalyzing, auto you know, forward uh, catalyzing the uh, MOS phosphorylation, which catalyzes another phosphorylation of another protein, which then uh, positively stimulates Matt Kinase itself. So this whole thing is a, a set of positive reactions. Each, each of the phosphoproteins increases uh, the, the uh, enzymatic uh, tendency to, uh, for each of the other phosphoproteins to be produced. So you can see that this is kind of on a hair trigger. If any one of these phosphoproteins gets produced, then it'll increase all the other ones, um, and it'll uh, be a very cooperative procedure. And that's what this furthest towards the axis in the lower uh, left-hand corner, where you have this positive feedback uh, alone causes this very uh, great tendency to, to just jump up from zero to very high uh, response uh, uh, with very little sense stimulus. Well, that's dangerous. You, don't, you want it to be nearly vertical, but you don't want it to be nearly as vertical at zero stimulus because that's unstable. So you want to move it over, and that's where the ultrasensitivity comes in when you have this chain of modifiers, putting both together as a solid black line where it's shifted over, so you have uh, this actually, this assay was done with um, moss rather than progesterone as the input, um, uh, but, the, but the, you can see the overall um, uh, increased cooperativity and shifting to the, to the right. So that's an example of how you can get this very high Hill coefficient and where you can get bistability without stochastic. You can imagine that you can have stochastic bistability. If you have one molecule in the cell, and either it's there or it's not, then you have bistability. You have two states for the cell. Either it's the cell with the molecule or without. But here you can see that even with a, with a very large cell, xenopus oocytes being one of the largest cells, and, and very large amounts of proteins, enough that you can easily see them in proteomics, um, you can still achieve bistability with the right kinetic model. Not every random model would have 
uh, achieve that high health coefficient. Okay, so we're just going to briefly mention the other way of getting my stability, which is via stochastics of small molecules. And here, uh, the uh, an example, so instead of dealing with very large cells with very large numbers of molecules involved, here in, in uh, say, bacteria in particular, phage-infected bacteria, you, you often have the case, generally have the case, of very small bursts of activity. A transcription factor will bind to a promoter. It, it will cause, before the transcription factor comes off, it may cause a small burst of a couple of uh, RNA transcripts being made by a couple of uh, RNA polymerases seeing those transcription factors. Then each of those RNAs cause its own bursts of protein synthesis where a whole series of ribosomes will bind in a, in a polysome and you'll get this double burst of RNA and protein. And, and this, the stochastic binding of that transcription factor that starts that burst um, uh, is modeled, can be modeled by uh, reasonably measured parameters for each of these steps. And you can see that cells 1, 2, and 3 in the lower left of slide 25, uh, where time is a horizontal axis up to, say, 45 minutes, or a cell division or two, um, while uh, the number of product proteins here measured in dimers of protein um, fluctuates, where cell 1 takes, gets an early start, early burst, and cell 3 hasn't quite hit its uh, burst yet. So you can see there's a lot of variation. And this is one way of achieving a bistable switch. But as you've seen, not the only way. You can also do it where all the proteins are present in a large amounts. If you do choose to go the stochastic route, and this might be an interesting project for some of you, it's by no means shown to be mission critical for uh, the community of uh, systems modelers, but it is, uh, many people believe it is a, a way to go. Um, there has been great progress since 1977 when uh, Gillespie proposed uh, the, uh, the, the algorithm named after him for uh, stochastic simulation of a couple of chemical reactions in general, not just biological, biochemical reactions. Uh, since then, Gibson and Brunk, in the, uh, uh, within the last couple of years, has come up with an algorithm which is now uh, time proportional to logarithm of the number of reactions rather than the number of reactions. Any time you go from n to log n, this is a uh, big progress, and this is done by um, uh, better tracking of calculations that you um, can reuse. And that's, uh, so I encourage you to take a look at this um, aspect of stochastics. Another aspect is people often think of the stochastics as kind of a nuisance. They increase the computer time that it takes to do simulations. They increase your uncertainty about the simulations that you then produce. Um, but there is an aspect of it which is just beginning to be harnessed in various fields of engineering, and biological engineering is no exception. And I give you two examples here to just whet your appetite again. I'm not going to go through them. But you can see that, that you can actually make switches and amplifiers for gene expression, gene expression being one of our favorite topics in this course, which are based on noise, and where you can get by stability as uh, using these uh, fluctuations. But, and that's not too unexpected based on what we've just been saying, but in addition you can get stochastic focusing where the fluctuation allows uh, enhanced sensitivity. Okay, so I encourage you to look at that. Now a particular place where you might worry that stochastics is coming into play quite a bit is in chromosome copy number, whether this is eukaryotic chromosomes or in the case we'll illustrate, a very simple case of plasmid chromosomes. Now the interesting thing about plasmids is uh, they can either be in lockstep with cell division, the way that eukaryotic chromosomes are, in the case of the xenopus oocytes we just talked about, where it makes a, a big decision. And that's the case of the R1 plasmas. Or it can be more of a kind of a cloud of uh, copy number, where they're trying to be close to a target number, where you have more copies than one per cell. And so uh, as the cell divides, it kind of randomly takes uh, a partition of that uh, uh, that number of uh, plasmids, and coli-1 is an example of that. And we want to, you know, you model it in order to determine the, the factors that govern it. Um, this has implication uh, that the copy number will affect the, ex the expression levels, and the expression levels are of uh, importance to biotechnology, and plasmids are, of course, 
also important in pathogenesis, the copy number affects pathogenesis, uh, since plasmids are a major way that drug resistance elements are passed around. So let's take a, take a look at one highly, hopefully, highly oversimplified version of this. Um, here you have two RNAs, imaginatively called RNA1 and RNA2. The start, RNA2 is transcribed here from on the bottom strand from right to left. You, uh, and when it is, so, so actually look at the very bottom of slide 30, uh, the, the, the magenta RNA polymerase is making RNA2. And if nothing binds to RNA2, uh, no, if RNA1 does not bind to it, RNA-H will cleave it, it will then bind the blue DNA polymerase, and will start replicating the plasmid. On the other hand, if RNA1, which is on the, made on the opposite strand of RNA2, it's this antisense story, it will then come and bind to RNA2, sort of in trans, it acts as a transacting inhibitor, it's aided and embedded by the ROM protein, and now you don't get cleavage of RNA-H, and so DNA polymerase doesn't have a primer uh, upon which to act, and you don't get replication. And this is, of course, not just a yes or no thing. This is something that's regulated and allows it to, to feedback to get the right copy number. You don't want it to get an infinite copy number, or else it will choke the cell that's harboring it. But you don't want it to drop down low enough so that then many cells will segregate with no uh, co uh, copies of the plasma. So you want to have a mass balance. You have to have conservation of mass. Uh, you want to be able to model both the uh, initiation and degradation and inhibition. So you do this by making some simplifications that the RNA-H rate is fast. Remember, we had slow and fast reactions that we would eliminate. Um, uh, so, so too with the DNA polymerization uh, by subsuming the RNA-2 concentration in an RNA-1-based model, you can simplify it so that you're really only considering two species, RNA-1 and the plasma DNA itself. We'll call these R and N for, new, uh, for the two different uh, molecules. So this is just a way of introducing a two-species model. We're going to come up with a rate equation for uh, change in RNA with respect of RNA1 with respect to time, and then the next slide will show the change in concentration of the plasma. Concentration of the RNA is, uh, is R, concentration of plasma is N. We have DRDT and DNDT. And this is very simple. It's just like the, what we were talking about with the metabolites. Um, you synthesize the RNA, that's a positive term, you degrade it, or you dilute it out. The dilution is Based on the growth rate, mu is a typical, it's a, used in growth rates in population genetics, and here it's used in chemical kinetics. In fact, this is, in a certain sense, one, an example of a very exciting field where you bring together population genetics and uh, um, uh, chemical kinetics into one place. Uh, and population genetics and chemical kinetics, when they come together, uh, unites some of the most disparate parts of this course. Okay, so now we've got an equation here where the positive term is K1, the rate of, of initiation of RNA synthesis. And it's, of course, the more molecules in, in the higher the concentration of the plasmid, then the more RNA you're going to make. So that makes sense that you have the product of the rate constant times the number of plasmids. Similarly, the, the loss of it is going to be related to the number of RNAs. The more RNAs you have, the more that you're going to lose, the more that you have to lose. And this is now, so that's for the RNA, and this is for the DNA. Um, here you have uh, dependence on the RNA. Uh, RNA1, remember, is the, the thing that we modeled in the previous slide, is uh, an inhibitor. And so it's going to, when it binds to RNA2, which is, not ex which is implicitly modeled here, it's going to have this in inhibitory uh, constant in the denominator. Um, and so as the inhibitor RNA goes up, this, this inhibitory term goes up, and the rate, the forward rate, goes down. Um, and it's, of course, depend, the, the, the rate of replication is going to be also dependent on plasma copy number, so it goes up within. It's dilute, the dilution rate is, of course, dependent on N as well. So the idea of this in the next slide is going to be to solve the plasma number. So in slide 34, we have how you would implement those two equations that we had in the last two slides uh, are shown on the very top 
left uh, part of the slide. Uh, DR, it, DRDT is abbreviated DR here um, in the Mathematica format. It's that same K1 constant times N is the, the concentration of plasma molecules. And then the negative is the, is the degradation uh, rate and the d dilution by uh, cell division mu. Uh, and that's times R, which is the concentration of the inhibitory RNA, RNA1. Um, and then the, uh, an analysis equation, which we've already seen before, for the plasma molecules in, uh, the change in concentration of N is a function of time dN, dT, here abbreviated dN, uh, is, is there. And, and then uh, uh, we're going to solve it. So th these first three things are setting it up and asking the program to solve it. Uh, and we're do it under the constraints of dr dt is equal to zero, d dn dt is equal to zero. You will recognize this is a steady state assumption, even though there are fluxes in and out of the, that are non-zero. The net effect is is zero, and so that's the formula for the steady state. We're going to start at a dilution rate of one, where you'll have some steady state level, and then we're going to watch the dynamics as it goes to d a dilution rate that's slower. If the, the, that is to say, the growth rate is slower, and as the growth rate is slower. Um, you expect maybe to accumulate more plasma molecules because they're not in lockstep with the, the, the cell division rate. The cell s grows more slowly. And there's not some other feedback, and we haven't put any other feedback in this model. Then it should uh, go to about twice the level. And so basically, as, as you as you now do, so you do the 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 uh, uh, symbolic solver in the top here, and you get this symbolic solution here. And if you do the numeric solver in D-solve, um, then you can uh, you get a very similar uh, solution. And you can plot it. Here you're plotting Y, which is a plasma copy number um, from uh, over a, a time range of 0 to 3. And you can see it goes up from slightly over 1 to slightly over 2 in terms of uh, the concentration of the plasma, as you might expect from lowering the uh, um, dilution curve. Just as we had stochastic models for the bistability that we talked about earlier, you know, the Xenopus bistability could be continuous and the lambda could be lambda model could be stochastic. Here there are stochastic models for copy number control, CNC, uh, which are very interesting. I urge you to look at them, um, where you can have basically uh, using stochastic modeling to do molecular clocks where you can reduce the, the rate of plasma loss. You can see in that la last one, if you had a very small number of molecules, you would have a, a, a loss uh, in some of the cells that would be more accurately modeled in a stochastic model. Now we want to go uh, from these models of red blood cell where you have metabolism without polymer synthesis and the CNC model where you have polymer synthesis of RNA and DNA uh, but without metabolism, to a, a, a more integrated cell where you have both going on um, and you want to represent the full optimization that must occur, getting metabolism optimally suited so that you get the right kinds of macromolecules made uh, in a complicated cell like E. coli, which can adjust to a wide variety of different growth conditions. So what are the problems here? The number of parameters that we that we needed and had for the red blood cell was enormous. It was 200. It was a tour de force to get those. For E. coli, it's orders of magnitude more that are needed because instead of 40 enzymes, we have, you know, uh, somewhere between 400 and 4,000. So measuring parameters is a problem, and we have the same problem about in vitro versus in vivo. We have the same set of constraints. Um, and we want to focus our, uh, more of our attention now on the, on the flux uh, constraints. So uh, after a short break, we're going to come back and talk about the flux balance as a solution to this. And just as we had uh, with uh, the red blood cell, we're going to be focusing in on ways to, to, to re-look re at the way we think about the synthesis and degradation of the, of the molecules in, the, in this network to see if we can rephrase it in a way where we can ask quite interesting questions about the optimization of these sim systems. So um, take a quick break, and we'll, we'll uh, the second half, we'll talk about the flux balance. <laughs>